Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, and so that this is a, an emerging topic. And so I'm going to try to do my best to, to relay with you uh, some, some of the newer concepts and maybe some of the concepts that have been around all along, but we might want to revisit a little bit. So times have changed, and we, we all can, can reminisce about what life was like even in our own childhood. We can certainly look back in history and say how human beings have changed with regards to physical activity. And when I say physical activity today in my talk, I'm going to use it generally. It's a large umbrella. It's, it's, it's literally bodily movement that utilizes skeletal muscle. So one way to look at this is the anthropological aspect, and a recent grant of ours is starting to look at that with colleagues who, who, who have a keen interest in understanding how maybe some of the early hunter-gatherers uh, behaved, what kinds of behaviors they did. So for example, in the summer, we were able to put on little devices that could measure activity every single second of the day for weeks in these people. So sometimes we would measure how much sitting, standing, walking they're doing, so on. And other times we would use EMG and measure what kind of muscular activity is taking place. So this is the kind of uh, one type of translational data that can maybe even help guide us in terms of interventions to better understand uh, what kind of movement human beings are, are particularly good at doing. One of the most interesting things about this field as it's exploded in the last decade is how regardless of what nation you're looking at, if it's a modern industrialized type country, you see really similar numbers in terms of the distribution of how people behave with regards to physical activity. We spend most of our time sedentary, and I'll show you some of those numbers later. But when we're not sedentary, when we're not sitting idle, we tend to be performing low intensity physical activity. So it is a type of physical activity. So it just happens to be below that, that three met level that has received most of the research to date and th therefore most of the evidence-based guidelines. So one of the underlying premises that I have is that cells and tissues in the body are constantly sensing their environment. They have to. And what they're sensing is very specific to what the environment is saying to it. And so that's a, that's a very simplistic way of putting it. But you could think in terms of any type of cellular response that you might happen to study on your own. And you have to say, what is the stimulus? And oftentimes in this field, people are, are, are very energetic and very engaged in saying, let's roll out some interventions. But oftentimes we tend to maybe not think, just because we don't have enough data at this point, to say what are the specific stimuli that the body is sensing when you're sitting here for an hour to listen to a talk. Conversely, what would be the stimuli when you get up and you walk out of here? Things are happening. And at the cellular level, the cells that are involved in this, for example, in some of your leg muscles, the, the change is not subtle. At the cellular level, the change is quite profound. And so if we, if we take that point and we combine it with the point of how people behave, then we can really start to understand what human beings perhaps need with regards to good health. So this is data where we have measured with a device called an active pal. It's a, it's a little miniature electronic device that you can tape to the front of the thigh. And it measures posture. It measures whether your leg is, is inclined or, or, or flat. And then can also, of course, measure stepping and movement. So it's a very accurate way of, of measuring those simple type of behaviors. And that I want you to notice the numbers here. To be quantitative is very important. This is simply just an observation of a, of a cohort of people. It's about 100 women. And we've now done this in, in many hundreds of people of all ages. And we can measure how much time people spend sitting inactive versus how much time they spend doing other behaviors. And notice that. The, the quartile range between the first and the fourth quartile is about four hours a day or 29 hours a week. That's an enormous amount of time, and I would submit it's an enormous stimulus for the type of muscle fibers that are involved in doing that. 
and for the type of blood vessels that are feeding those muscle fibers and for the type of substrates that are being utilized by those muscle fibers and also other type of systemic responses that help that. So this is a very large stimulus. I think that oftentimes reporters and, and some folks lose sight of this. They, they tend to view this as a stepping stone to real exercise. And I would argue that if you look at the cellular level, it's nothing, it's, it's not a stepping stone. It's actually quite a large stimulus in terms of the dosage. It's just a lower whole body intensity. So it might take less effort. So this slide really speaks for itself. 30 minutes really is a small fraction of the day. So the specificity principle is just simply that the unique signals that might harm the body during physical inactivity are specific and distinct from the processes that the current guidelines and prescriptions tell us to do. So let's, let's unpack this just a little bit more and we're gonna talk first about how different types of muscle respond. Those of you who study animal models, when you take out muscles, you probably pay, pay very great attention to what muscles you're sampling because you know that some muscles will respond to your treatment, whether it's pharmacological, nutritional, or exercise, and other types of muscles won't respond. In fact, sometimes you can even get opposite type of responses. So we also know that the phenotype and the underlying proteins that make up the phenotypic responses to tissues are very different between different muscle types. Human beings also have diverse fiber types. And I think that that's an important point for understanding how this low intensity physical activity or LEPA can contribute both distinct signals, but also some potent signals for, for affecting health. And so one of the underlying uh, principles that we all understand from a variety of techniques, including uh, single cell EMG and, and fiber type depletion and so on, is that during low intensity contractile activity, or that what we might call low effort contractile activity, you're gonna recruit a small fraction of the total muscle fibers. Some muscles are recruited more than others, especially depending upon the task. But when you do that, the fibers that are recruited are, are working at a very high intensity. It's, it's not a quite an all or none type phenomenon like in some excitable cell types, but it's very close to that meaning that if you measured the ATP turnover, for example, in the fibers that are recruited, it would be over 50 fold generally for, for even what we would call low intensity contractile activity. And that type of muscle is also fatigue resistant. It's, it's unique in, in a variety of properties, including some of the biochemical properties that are important for metabolic health. And I'll show you some of that data. So going back to the big picture, we can, we can start to ask some, some practical questions in the last decade, such as, are exercisers actually less sedentary? And that sounds a little bit odd to ask, but when we think about the total day, how much does that 30 minutes or 60 minutes of exercise that is recommended for good health, even if we do it, how much is that changing our total portfolio of sedentary time? So this is an example of one such study, and there's now been several others. Um, this data is not showing the EMG data, but rather it's just showing the sitting, standing, and walking type behaviors. So even folks who engage in 300 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's still a small amount of the total time in the day and not enough to, to impact the total sedentary time. There's a number of studies that are starting to look at, just like with exercise, what kinds of of interplay we have between exercise and large amounts of light activity. And so these are the types of, of signals one might see with EMG if you put a, 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 on the proper muscle, for example, a postural muscle such as the soleus in the calf of a human. You'd see that, that there is some contractile activity almost every time we're up on our feet. And of course, it will be stronger when we walk. But that one thing is consistent is that when we're inactive, the signals go silent. So you can imagine now when we talk about, well, what are, what are the underlying signals that are leading to adaptive changes or perhaps to acute metabolic changes? You can start to see that there's this on-off type switch to controlling uh, both the, some of the, the, the signals such as calcium fluxes, 
uh, other ionic changes, certainly ATP turnover and metabolic changes. These can be very abrupt and large changes when we take a break from either sitting or from up moving around. So th this data now is backing up another step further and it's showing you in about 350 people the distribution of how different individuals behave. So, so notice the, the widespread here in these histograms. The, the mean, or, the, or I should say the median time in this particular group was about 11 hours a day of sitting time. So that's a lot of time that we might have in inactivity. It's also a lot of opportunity for time for there to be more contractile activity. And you, and you can see that, for example, over the top, just how much time people might be engaged in upright behaviors. And, and you can, again, see a large spread. But they, these numbers aren't small. I mean, even, even five and a half hours a day, that's a lot of time of contractile activity. So you can imagine if you removed substantial amounts of that, what would it do to the body? Well, this is, this is looking at the energetics of it. And so using doubly labeled water, we can, we can uh, categorize how people expend their energy when we combine it with other techniques. And you can see that even if one is engaged in 300 minutes per week of exercise, that's a very important slice of the pie for health. And a lot of the, the important uh, responses to exercise, of course, are independent of calories. But I'm just trying to give you a sense, a gauge, especially since that the current guidelines for uh, two and a half hours of moderate or, or uh, equivalent amounts of vigorous are based around calories. And so I wanna give you a sense of, well, how many calories do people expend in this low intensity physical activity range? And that would be the blue slice. So you can imagine that if you cut that slice out of the pie, that's gonna be a very large change in, in energy expenditure. And so when we talk about sedentary behavior, we really could rename the whole field if we wanted. We, we, we practically could call it uh, low intensity physical activity or non-exercise activity because they really are the, the two opposites. If you sit less or you sit more, you're gonna have a change in this uh, seesaw here in terms of how much time we have in physical activity. Again, it may not be the prescribed activity but nevertheless, it does involve muscles and it does involve bodily movement, which of course is the definition of activity. So in our society, we've become very sedentary and we seem to be progressing in that direction. And there are several data sets that are looking at that. Um, and it's, it's quite intriguing to see. Uh, one way to look at it is, is look at just, just the demographics of according to age. In our own studies, we're seeing that, for example, and I think others are seeing the same thing, that younger people are not more active when we look at the total portfolio of activity throughout the day. Meaning that we can take folks who are uh, in their 20s and early 30s, healthy and everything else being the same, we see that they, they actually spend about an hour a day more sitting and inactive than do people who are 15 to 20 years older. We also see that teenagers are, tend to be very inactive. So if things are progressing as they do, most technologies tend to be seductive in terms of luring us into looking at screens and to becoming very immobile. The epidemiology of this field is what's really grown the most rapidly in the last decade. And that these, these two studies from Edmondson and Wilmot have, have done a meta-analysis and we've just reviewed this and, and I really want to just point out here, notice the, the high durations that we're talking about. With, with, for example, take the TV time studies. They're comparing people in the first row, you can see folks who watch more than 5.7 hours per day versus less than one hour. Large differences in behavior that we're describing. And you can go throughout this. So when you read in the newspaper or when you read in the introduction of a paper and it says that sedentary behavior is related to and they might give some measurement of inactivity. And then they might say, and therefore, we're gonna de devise an intervention, or therefore, we're, if it's in a magazine, they're gonna give some fitness tip. You need to pay attention. If we're gonna use evidence-based medicine, which is what's guided the MVPA recommendation, in fact, most of those recommendations for MVPA, of course, are centered around epidemiological type data, 
then we have to look at this data closely too. And what it's telling us is that hours per day, not minutes per day, is what seems to be related to type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and I could show you all-cause mortality and so on. So that, uh, that's point one. And that then uh, secondly is look at the magnitude of effect we're talking about. So when we pool these studies and get a pooled uh, risk ratio, it's 2.12 fold for diabetes. Okay? That is very large. And by the way, many of these studies did this where they, they did use covariates and they showed it was independent of MBPA, independent of weight, independent of, of classical risk factors. This is very large. This is, this is actually much larger than the relative risk from similar type of analyses for the current recommendation of MBPA. It's, it's much larger than the recommendations for lowering sugar intake are from dietary changes. Nobody's saying that diet's unimportant. Nobody's saying the exercise is unimportant. I'm just saying this is what the meta-analyses are showing. I think what we're seeing then is that there's another aspect of human behavior that we have an opportunity to pr improve human health. That's good news. So one of the underlying concepts of this whole paradigm is that although regular exercise prescription is rare, too rare, we should all do more of it, but it's also very healthy, sitting is actually very ubiquitous. We all sit. We have to sit to do your profession, to, tr to commute, and so on. Sitting, like I said before, is seductive because most of the recreational type behaviors that are at least sold to us through TV and games and stuff and good meals and music concerts and movies, we, st we tend to sit again. And so sitting is common, uh, but nevertheless, it's hazardous to our health. When this whole area got started, one of the most frequent questions I was either asked by reporters or by scientists who are a little skeptical was, well, if it's so bad for us, why, why would we have been talking about this for years? Why hasn't somebody shined the light on this before? And it's just simply, we, just because behaviors are common doesn't make them safe. We've seen examples of that, for example, with cigarette smoking and tobacco use. It used to be we decorated our houses with ashtrays. We gave ashtrays as gifts, and we invited people over to our house, and we didn't think anything about the secondhand smoke. So that was a common behavior, but nonetheless, it was hazardous. So what, and, and another important concept that, that dovetails in with that is that we believe that, that qualitatively there are distinct processes that are responding to this balance of inactivity or generally lower effort type of activities. And sometimes with very high sensitivity to inactivity, meaning that we can see responses within hours, uh, sometimes even less than an hour, that are very marked. And are, and are important physiological responses. In some cases, we can show that the processes are not at all impacted by the, the traditional types of exercise. And that might have something to do with the fiber type. It might have something to do with the dose that we're talking about. So when we think about substrates or fuels, active muscle can be a, a, a reliable sink for using energy. The type of fuel that that muscle is using, of course, is dependent upon what muscle is contracting and the duration of contractile activity and so on. But nonetheless, either for, for lipid metabolism or for glucose metabolism, one thing that's certain is that when muscle starts contracting, the metabolic profile of that muscle changes dramatically. Locally, though, and so when we think about the fate of substrates that are circulating in the bloodstream, it's not just the concentration of risk factors that are, serve as biomarkers, but rather the fate of those substrates is very important. So for example, you can think about the lipid that's carried in lipoproteins and, and an enzyme such as lipoprotein lipase that serves as a gatekeeper for, for determining the distribution of that circulating lipid, that we can see that the lipid, we want it to go into the active working red type muscle. Uh, and so it can, that type of muscle has a high oxidative capacity and can handle a high uh, lipid load if it's contracting a lot. Conversely, other type of tissues, such as the liver and so on, that's where we don't want that lipid going. So these things are taking place literally on a minute by minute basis once muscle starts working or starts resting. This is an example of one of our earlier studies in rats where we were able to take out different uh, regions of, of leg muscles. 
and we can measure that enzyme lipoprotein lipase. So think of it sort of like a vacuum cleaner for fat in the bloodstream. And a high level of activity is a measurement of the ability to hydrolyze and extract that fat from the blood. And so the slow twitch red muscle, uh, example again, like I said, is the deep muscle in your calf, the soleus, is, is very rich in lipoprotein lipase, tenfold more rich than in some of the other muscle sections. However, that's only when the animals are active, meaning that they're just in their cage, up milling around, moving around. But if you, if you study animals, and we've done this three or four different models, where we've, we've made the animals inactive, such as high limb unloading, tenotomy, casting, or even when animals are just lying down and we just observe them, th then we can remove the muscles and we can see that this enzyme is very sensitive to the amount of contractile activity, such that this high level that's normally in the slow twitch red muscle is no longer high uh, after a night of being uh, inactive. It's a local mechanism as well. And we've also used radioactive tracers to look at the distribution of lipids in the body. It follows that. So you all know what the public health guidelines are. And, you, and they've, they've changed relatively little uh, in the last 10, 15 years. There's been some changes. Uh, um, perhaps the one that, that uh, hasn't received that much attention, but it used to say that you try to get, get about 150 minutes a week of moderate activity on most days of the week do something, so that might be 30 minutes on five days, and they've removed that clause about most days of the week. Okay, and so those are good recommendations. Nobody is suggesting that they change, but I want you to understand the distinction that we're talking about here is enormous. And so, whereas the exercise recommendation is about doing activity in at least 10 minute bouts, it's very explicit about that, at least three METs, it's very explicit about that, that produces a noticeable increase in ventilation or heart rate or sweating for the individual, and then also to, to accumulate a certain amount of calorie equivalents per week. So it's, it's a very clearly defined type of recommendation. And I think it's actually very helpful for science that we have that so that when we talk about someday what, what might be the recommendations for low intensity activity, we will have those, those, that contrast there very clearly defined. So having said that, one thing that we need to be cautious about is, is a frequent question is, well, how much exercise, real exercise, can I do to overcome the problem of being sedentary? That's a fine question to ask, but, but it actually is kind of missing the point, is that there is this unique set of pathways in the body that's responding to this high duration of low activity that occurs throughout the day. That's an opportunity to improve health independent of the MVPA meaning that you could, they can be additive, uh, you can get the benefit of both. And, and so I have to sometimes use an analogy for folks who still don't buy into that argument. And I might say, well, take, for example, control of blood glucose. I can control blood glucose by giving somebody a pharmaceutical agent like metformin. I could also change it perhaps by what they eat. But I would never tell the patient, stop exercising because now I've given you metformin or I've changed your diet. We'd say, no, there's other benefits, but we'd also say that the pathways that, that's contracting muscle might improve blood glucose can be distinct from these others, and therefore you might get more total effect. It's, it's, it's another tool to take advantage of. Okay, so we've seen this slide before. And we also know that we don't have enough people doing moderate to vigorous activity. So now I'm going to talk about this question about how there might be some distinct signals. I'm just going to give you one or two examples quickly here. But that uh, one I've already mentioned with lipoprotein lipase. We've taken the exact same strain of, of rats, and we've done this with mice, and now we've done it with people, where we can have individuals exercise on some days. We can have them either sedentary or doing a large amount of low-intensity physical activity. There's a variety of ways that we can match it up, either on a calorie basis or what's the recommendation, and so on. But one point is that in the animal models, we actually found it very difficult to increase LPL activity, except in the fast twitch white muscles. And you can see that's the muscle that normally has low levels. Statistically speaking, it's, it's very significant. It's a two and a half fold increase, but it's starting at a very low level. So we would submit that while that's good for us, and it may actually have some impact on the fate of lipids in our blood, it may actually even lower triglycerides, 
there's going to probably be other processes, such as what Dr. Gills studied previously, that exercise might be more potent at working through, whereas this other end of the continuum might work more through LPL. We've also now done two different studies with very different types of patient populations where we've tried to raise LPL in humans and we've been unsuccessful at doing that. This particular study with Mike Harrison here in Ireland, we collaborated with him. He provided us with tissue samples and we were unable to see a rise in LPL even when young men did 100 minutes of very vigorous exercise that led to almost you know, as low of glycogen depletion as you can get. In one trial, he refed the individuals and one he didn't. And you can see that in neither case were we able to raise LPL. And muscle. And you could also see that in the same type of people that the lipoproteins are highly correlated uh, with LPL levels in the muscle in what we call the ambulatory control trial, meaning when they did not exercise. Once they exercised, that correlation was gone, meaning that there's probably other processes that are important. Um, we've, we've also done uh, correlative type studies and shown some very large differences say, for example, between that first and fourth quartile that I've shared with you. And you can see that uh, um, for insulin and VLDL particles, LDL particles, this is just an example. But these magnitude of changes are not a stepping stone. These are very large. And so we want to raise the, the hypothesis that if for just a logical statement, somebody who's currently not exercising, which is a lot of people, that it's plausible they can actually be more unhealthy in the future if they become more sedentary. When we think in terms of a population or society, we can certainly argue that we can get more unhealthy as a result of that. And so I want to uh, conclude by reminding you that this simple but profound rationale, cells receive input from their environment every single minute of the day. And it's a major opportunity for translational research and certainly for public health efforts, that some of the most potent mechanisms that are at the root cause of chronic disease are caused by muscular inactivity that generally occurs when we're sitting and specifically are linked to the physiological need for what I would argue is very frequent muscular activity throughout the whole day, not just that 30-minute sliver. Thank you. <laughs>